All right. So Jimmy, you probably hear this a lot, <laughs> but your, your book, Keto Clarity was the first book that I read that introed me to keto. And I know there it is guys. If you're watching on YouTube, he's got it right there. That purple book, Keto Clarity. It's on audible too. Um, this was the intro for, I would say like, honestly, most of us <laughs> to a ketogenic diet. Can you, can you share like, cause this, you wrote this book back in 2005. 14. Okay. Okay. But you're, tell us where your keto journey started and how you were able to write that, that book. Yeah. So my, my low carb journey started back in 2004. I went on yeah. the act. I got a diet book for Christmas. It was no, uh, I guess clue to anyone. I needed to lose weight. And it's so funny in our culture, we always say, okay, you have a weight problem. No, I didn't have a weight problem. And anybody that has extra weight on their body, your problem is not weight. Yes, you have weight, but that's not your problem. Your problem is your habits and what mm -hmm. got you to be that bigger weight. Your problem is the inflammation that comes from that habits. Your problem is you're not eating to your hormones. You're trying to eat to some arbitrary calories. Your problem is you've been given all the wrong information. And that was my story, yep. Tara, for so long. Mm -hmm. And so along comes this Atkins diet. And I'm going, mm -hmm. okay, this brother's whacked. What is he talking about? But I started doing it and I'm like, all right, this food tastes pretty good. Yeah, I miss Coke. I miss all the junk food I used to eat. I was a junk food junkie. I, I added up one time, Tara, the number of carbs I used to eat a day, 1,600 grams. Wow, wow, wow. And then the introduction, uh, uh, induction phase of the acazide is 20 grams. <sighs> so to say I was a little hurting in the first few days is putting it mildly. Right. Uh, but once I got beyond that, once I started feeling better very quickly, obviously I lost weight. But more importantly, I was coming off of drugs. I had respiratory issues. It came off of that pretty quick within about six weeks. Um, and I came off of the high blood pressure medication because I was getting dizzy, getting up off the couch, still taking the med. It, I held on to the statin, the, the cholesterol one for the longest time thinking I needed it. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't need it anymore. I feel good. Why do I want to keep taking this? So I stopped it nine months in mm -hmm. and 15 years later, still have not been back on any drugs since. Totally. Um, yeah, I did lose a gob of weight that year, 180 pounds. Yeah, just a little. I criticize quite a bit now because I did put back on some of the weight that I had lost, but my health markers are spectacular. I feel good. My energy's great. My mental, I, I, I'm smarter at 48 years old than I ever was at 20 something. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for me, that's the pay dirt. Like we all, people are like, are you disappointed that, that you're not meeting your goals? I'm like, I've met every goal I've wanted. Mm -hmm. I want to be healthy. I want to feel good. Would I like to lose weight? Duh. But at the end of the day, to me, that's not what drives me, what motivates me now. What motivates me now is being a teacher and having a lucid enough brain to be able to do that work. And so I took that story, made something of it, became a blogger first, then a podcaster, longest running health podcast, live in the Vita Low Carb Show. I do a daily show right here called Jimmy Rants. I do all kinds of stuff now. I'm a content provider. Uh, big time. You probably have never seen somebody do so much content as me. I don't know what nope. makes me do it, Sarah. I just love every minute of it. I love it. I love it. I want to dig into a couple of things there. And first thing I want to talk about is the brain power that you're experiencing. Because like for me, when I go to events, especially I've noticed it at like Metabolic Health Summit. And when I go there, I'm like, these are some brain optimized people. These are all a bunch of happy abundance mindset people who are all, we're all technically competitors. We're all, you know, like, but no one's acting like that. It's like, Hey, what's up? How can I support you? Oh my gosh. That's so great. Like it's this really loving, wonderful environment. And yeah. I truly believe that that's how people, that's how humans would be like almost all humans. If they were healthier, like when your brain gets starts functioning correctly, you start functioning correctly. You start behaving in a way that is more in line with your highest self. And so I love that you said that because you're like, 
my, although yes, do I want to look like more shredded or whatever? Sure. Is that going to be in the cards for everybody? Maybe not. But what has happened is you're experiencing health at a whole nother level. Your brain is on fire and you're going after all these dreams. Like, could you imagine like back when you, before you started this journey, being this like speaker all over the world, published author, like having this, all of this probably could you would not have ever been able to accept something like that. And the thing that's really the coolest, and it's why I love you and I love L. Russ and I love some of you guys that talk about these issues. I love me. Yeah. And <laughs> when people get to the point where they loathe themselves, there's no amount of dieting in the world, no amount of movement in the world, no amount of anything. Till you love yourself, you're not going to progress anywhere. And I think we forget about the most important part of any successful plan in health is right here. And if you can't get that six inches between your ears to come on straight, and it's what, again, why I adore your work. I'm all the time watching your Instagram lives and engaging because you're one of those people and it's the few, the proud. There's not many people talking about the whole mindset aspect of things. And that's, it's why I adore you and what you do. Likewise. That is so critical. And yeah, I try to infuse it into my work as well because People want to feel worthy of the journey. Right. Um, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they feel like, well, the journey's beating me up. I'm like, you allowed it to beat you up. And it's time that you grab back control of that and grab back the reins of it. And it starts with loving yourself. And then from there, loving other people. And that's been my theme song. Love Jimmy. And then if Jimmy loves Jimmy, which sounds conceited, but get over it. No. Uh, if he loves Jimmy, then Jimmy can love people. Right. And Jimmy, well, then those people, guess what? Start loving themselves. And then they start loving people. And it's this cascade effect. And in this 2020 year that's been so messed up on so many levels, I think we need a whole lot more love. Yeah. Let's dig into this mental and emotional piece because here, like you can't pour from an empty cup and guess what? You know what? You actually can get really fit from a place of self-hate. There's a whole bunch of fitness people out there that do it, right? That something happened is there's usually some sort of unresolved trauma. Something triggered them. They equated my body must look like X for me to receive love. That is actually how I started my journey. I don't know if you know that about me, Jimmy, but like it was a marriage issues that I was like, okay, is if I just get hot, hotter, then it will fix everything. Right. So it drove me like a mother. I mean, I went from, you know, probably pushing on obese. I was definitely overweight after my fourth baby to shredded, like looking like a bodybuilder. And guess what? It didn't do any of that. I'm divorced. (laughs) That, That wasn't even the issue in the first place. It was all a story in my head. But what happened is I'm glad it happened that way because one, I learned that you can You can get fit from a place of self-hate, but you will end up in the exact same emotional place when you're done that you started. It doesn't heal anything. You're still looking for other people to tell you you're enough, to tell you you're beautiful. It it makes you very self-absorbed, very selfish because you need love from other people because you're not giving it to yourself. But what's but what, what I love about it is that we can also, while sometimes our journeys can start in a really unhealthy place, we can evolve and heal along that path. And for me, that came from mindset coaches, uh, personal development, reading, really digging into that, doing my own work, plant medicine journeys, and all of that brought me to this wonderful place of healing. Also learning about the human body, which I think has probably been part of your journey too. learning what, you know, you're educating on how amazing this incredible body that we have is you start to have this, this love that comes little by little. And now, now I can come because my cup is filled. I, and I love that you said, Jimmy loves Jimmy. Tara loves Tara too. I love it. We should all be able to say the kind things about ourselves that we say to other people. And when you can get there, you know, I was just, I just got off a coaching call with my clients and I'm sorry to talk so much. I got, we'll get back in a second, but I was telling them, I was reading a book where this lady said that she'll wink at herself in the mirror. Just, just to be a little flirty playfulness with herself. And I love that. That's because comes from mama Gina, but I love that so much. Um, and I think that once we get there, once we, once we do our own work of, of self-love, our actions follow suit and all of that, like love we were looking for from other people is just going to become because come, because when we give love, when we are love and you, you're exactly right. When it's filled, you can't not give it. It's just like, I love myself and I love all of you. And just what can I do for you? Then you start getting that love back. It's so cool. Huh? So 
I was. Sarah, this is why I love you so much. Is <laughs> put it in language that people. It, it's almost as if, why aren't you this way? Like sometimes you kind of get in people's heads with this kind of thing, and they think it's all woo woo and all this kind of thing. But really, this is where the rubber meets the road of your humanity. Like totally. I'm learning more and more. 2020 has shown a bright light on lots of parts of our humanity, mm -hmm. some not so nice parts of mm -hmm. humanity. And, and those parts are getting weeded out and cut it out. And maybe uh, people are feeling a little bit down from that. I've lost probably 40% of my friends this year for whatever really? reason. Decided to move on in their lives. Some that I thought were real, like deep, long time friends. I've known for mm. decades. Mm. And and but I've replaced them with wonderful people. And I've actually clung closer to some older friendships that have been rekindled. You're obviously one of those people that I uh consider very valuable in my life. And so I Likewise. think people just need to remember that it's mm -hmm. okay to let kind of those those relationships go that aren't serving you well. And you talk about this a lot in your work, those mm -hmm. toxic relationships that if they're not feeding into you, then they are sucking out of you. Yeah. And I'm feeders, not the suckers. Okay. I want to hit on this with you because this is one of the things I love about, I love about you so much because I have a small taste of it. Like I will... I'll push the edge a little bit on messages that I'm sharing that I know it might trigger people a little bit. You push the edge a lot. You are like fully out there like, hey, like leading, saying, hey, think about it this way. And I know you get backlash for it. I know because people people don't often like to be shaken out of their paradigm, right? They want to stay in their paradigm. And so when somebody's saying like, let me let me present a little higher way of thinking and and that threatens their current paradigm, people will lash out, right? So I'm, I know you get that a lot. And I want to ask like, what do you think it is in you, you know, maybe it's just experience and time of doing this, but like, what do you think it is that allows you to be able to bold? Cause I, I think all of us can learn a lesson from this to boldly share from your heart, how you feel to be non-apologetic about it. And just, you know, you, you don't do it in like a rude or crude way, but you do share boldly how you feel and that's it. And I know people come back at you and they're like, no, Jimmy. And they give you a bunch of crap. How, what do you think allows you to do that? It's a combination of things. And of course, it's the time in my life. I'm going through a really tough personal issue in my life right now. Like something people say is one of the worst things you go through. And so I think that also kind of motivates you to be a little more bold than you would, but for, so we'll set that one to the side. But yeah, I think my experience, and I also have become a lot more open about my vulnerability, which I know as a guy is rare. Most mm -hmm. of the vulnerability people online are all you chicks and mm -hmm. I love it. And I relate to you girls so much, mm -hmm. but there's not hardly any guys that are just like saying things bluntly. Like I am. Yeah. A lot of it was the work I did. I did a six month sabbatical last year from September mm -hmm. through I March. Uh, I remember talking to you at keto con last year at the Redmond's mm -hmm. real salt thing and telling you, you know, I got to get away. This is, uh, you know, I was at my brinks in and it was during that six months, Tara, I did so much soul searching, trying to figure out who I am as a man. And at the end of the day, at the, of the day, I was like, I'm not a fearful guy. Like I'm not afraid of consequences. You know, there's some people, they don't want to do anything that could jeopardize losing followers. I'm not about followers. I'm about yeah. who can I impact and who can I maybe motivate with something I share. So yeah, if I share something a little more skirting the edge while still remaining respectful in the conversation, I have had so many people write me privately and say, mm -hmm. oh my God, mm -hmm. thank you. Like yep. I felt like I was all alone and now I, I know I'm not alone. And you know, it, it's, it's risky to do that. I know. And you get backlash from it. And I'm like, yeah. But at the end of the day, I'm just confident in who I am as a guy and if somebody doesn't like that, then they can move on to the next boring person because I'm going to be Jimmy 100% mm -hmm. of the time. Mm -hmm. And if you like that, then you're not my people. Love it. I love it so much. I think all of us can really dig like, where are we not doing that in our lives? Where are we not sharing fully who we are? And it's so selfish. It is, I've learned it is so selfish because the, the reason I'm able to share my opinion and be unapologetic about it is because 
I'm meditating. I'm tapping into something bigger than me. I am. And that's what I'm hearing from you. You are in service. It's like, I, I feel compelled to share this thing come what may. And I, I feel personally that it's coming from something bigger than me. So it's just like, Hey, if somebody needed to hear that, awesome. And the same, it's usually those private messages that you get. Someone's not going to say like, Hey, guess what? I really needed this lesson on a comment, you know? Um, but I think when we are all, you know, you know, what you have going for you, you talk so freaking fast that you get it in there (laughs) and people like, by the time they absorb what you said, like five minutes ago, because their brain is still trying to actively listen to you. They're like, wait a second, that hurt. Uh, uh, Okay. I'm going to keep going. Like you've got that going for you. Talk a lot slower. (laughs) I just got, I've got so much coming through me. I'm like, I got to get it out. (laughs) You guys can rewind. (laughs) Um, so do you mind, is that when you were talking about going through something personal right now, that's hard. Is that something you're sharing or no? Um, well, I mean, I can't say a whole lot about it other than I'm divorcing my wife. Um, but yeah, yeah, it, it was in the midst of the, sabbatical when I went away and everything was stripped away from me I realized I had been married to my work Mm -hmm. because I was unhappy in my marriage and so Mm -hmm. I decided to leave um I don't want to say a whole lot more than that because we're still in the midst of it but it's something that I felt like I needed to do and and it has been tough for all the obvious reasons you've been through that before many Mm -hmm. people have been through that um, but I know I'm going to come out the other end of it stronger. Uh, I'm already happier and stronger in some of the things of adapting to the new, basically turning the page in that part of my life. And so, yeah, uh, when the time comes, I hope I can share a little more. I would obviously never do anything to in, in, uh, embarrass her. That's not my style. Oh, yeah. But it, it's that I would love to talk about in that realm. I'm just not able to yet. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And like, even just sharing that because it is such an emotional time. And I, I was just talking to a friend about this. I feel like, so your intuition comes in, your higher self comes in and it's like, you need to do this. You need to do this. And you're like, no, because of this, 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 all these safe reasons, but your higher self is like, please do it please do this for you. And it's like, no, no, no. And it, the image I get in my head, I have four kids is like, I imagine one of my toddlers, like clinging to a door, like the door molding or whatever, like with every little finger on it. And like, they're like, no, I want to. And you're like, I'm trying to actually take you to get ice cream or whatever right now. And they're like, no, I don't want to leave. And you're like, it's going to be okay. Like, trust me, everything's going to be good. I feel like the universe does that for us. Like the, that higher self comes in and we cling. And I like, sometimes the, I feel like the universe just slams door. We've all had those moments where it's like, no, you're not going that way. And then we have moments where we're, we're clinging and it's like, we're just going to close this door. And you're like, no, no, no. And it's slowly like prying each little finger away and you finally let go. And I, I know this sounds insensitive. I, people, I'm, people are probably gonna be like, Tara, that's messed up. But when, when I find out that people get divorced, I always say congratulations <laughs> because no. It's such yeah. a, it's such a bold, like pro you move because society in the world says you can't do that. It's like, no, no, no bad. It's like, you have to stare shame and guilt in the face and say, I'm choosing what feels right in my heart. So congratulations. It will be okay. It gets better. It gets way better. If you are doing what feels aligned with your higher self, it gets yeah. astronomically better. So yeah. Share that. Yeah. It doesn't help when you add the religious aspect of it. Nope. And then you add that I went through multiple divorces with both of my parents that kind of maybe made me stay in the relationship longer than I needed to. It's multifaceted and it's certainly something I hope I can talk about on the other side of it because there are some important lessons in there. Again, no disrespect to her, Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think we can help people with this kind of thing. And having been through that yourself, you know abundantly what I'm going through and what I'm talking about. Yeah. My ex-husband is remarried now. I love her. My kids love her. We are all like friends. It's all very supportive. Like everything gets, it gets, I mean, I, I, I do feel very lucky. I know that's not the case for a lot of people. It takes both people wanting peace and wanting to choose that and wanting to be compassionate and understanding of the other. And sometimes, you, you know, obviously you can't control what the other person does or how they react, but you know, I would say in general, I have a lot of divorced friends and all that. It just gets better. It's a huge emotional turmoil oil time. That is natural. That's going to happen. But you know, I'm what five, four years out from mine and 
it like that's it, this is life now and it's beautiful and everything has moved on and solid and happy and all of that again. So it, it does come. There is sunlight at the end of the tunnel for sure. Um, okay. I also I, but I, hasn't wrecked you at all. Yeah, it did. Oh, it, it did for a minute. <laughs> it's not fun. Now, way past it. It's, yeah. it's, it's encouraging to me to see you so happy and vibrant like you are now, Tara. And knowing now what you've been through, I would never have known. Yeah, I shared a picture. I'll have to text it to you, Jimmy, because I shared a picture on my um, Instagram once of when I was 30 and I'm 37 now. And the vibration, like I literally look dead inside. I looked yeah, at yeah. just my face. I, it's just like, there's no lights on. And that's what happened from choose, just choosing myself. And in society says, no, don't do that. That's selfish. Like you stay in this, like you made your bed, you lay in it, you stay suffering because that's the right, the right thing to do is to not choose yourself and stay suffering and sacrifice your life for something that feels out of alignment. And then I, I said, no, I'm not doing that. I left my religion. I left my, my marriage. I moved on. I continue to choose myself. Everything got healed. And now I'm, yeah, I, I would say I literally look like a different person, but I, more importantly, I feel like it. So it's, I, yeah, if anybody's listening, this resonates with you. And there's like something that your higher self is saying, please let it go. Whether it's like your career or an unhealthy relationship or just something that you feel stuck in, like, have courage, listen to that. Because, you know, Elle says this a lot. She says, every time you listen to that, you get a prize. <laughs> the universe gives you a prize for listening to your higher self. So just know it's coming. It's hard to choose that. And sometimes it's blind faith. It's like, I don't even know if things are going to get better. I got nothing waiting for me on their side. I don't have another job offer. I don't have another relationship waiting for me. I'm just blind faith. My higher self is asking me to do this. I'm asking if you're listening, do that. And um, that's the part of it is the what's to come. So, mm -hmm. yeah. and it's, I'll leave it right there. Let's move on. <laughs> it's all good. It is good. Okay. Can we, can we jump into a little bit more of, um, I'm curious if you're willing to share, I'm curious, like you're talking about what these habits and these mindsets that lead people to, into like lots of weight gain, you know? And like, uh, in my opinion, a lot of it is undealt with traumas from childhood, undealt with coping mechanisms. We don't even realize they're coping mechanisms. They just feel like normal life. Would you mind sharing some of that, like what you've learned from your journey? Yes. Yeah, so um, I did go through some pretty intense childhood trauma uh, at the age of, I turned 14 over the Christmas holiday. My birthday is December 27th. And right before I was supposed to go back, I was visiting my dad at the time, go back home to mom, which I had grown up with, um, and he would get visitation during the holidays. Um, he let me know that I would be living there. And I'm going, okay. Like it was oh, just wow. like, and I didn't know it was going to happen. Nobody told me. And then the day I was going to go back home to mom uh, was when I was told this. And so, over the next three and a half years, my dad was physically and emotionally abusive to me pretty much on a daily basis. Um, not to get too graphic, but he'd throw my head into walls. He would punch me in the face. Um, he would basically tell me I'm not a man mm -hmm. and that no woman would ever want me. And some of the just the ugliest things that a man should never tell their child. You have kids. Definitely. You would never imagine trying to demasculate your boys right. uh, or make them feel inferior in any way. And that's all he did to me. Now, in the moment, I'm like, what the bleep? Mm -hmm. But, and I almost killed myself. I've mm -hmm. never really shared that anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. But how could you not? Like when you're at that point of, and, and it was the fakery of it all as well. And I know mm -hmm. you said you left your religion we would be on the way to church. He'd be pummeling me in my head. And then we get out of the car at church. I'm still trying to figure out what the heck happened, why I'm hurting. And, and he's like, don't tell them I hit you. You fell. If I had a black eye. Hey, brother, brother. And it's just all the fake bullshit. Like mm -hmm. how I stayed Christian after all of that, I don't know. I still believe in God. Um, but man, that really shook every part of me that I thought was meaningful. Um, and so for three and a half years, I went through that torment and it took 15 years just to kind of 
stop looking over my shoulder thinking he was coming to kill me, Tara. Mm. Now, honestly, when I went off to college and, and then early in my marriage and then just kind of trying to figure out life, I was reeling mm -hmm. and it was tough. And this is the part of the trauma, uh, which is what you asked about, that either people grow stronger from it or they grow weaker from it. And I'm going to be honest for a while there, I was weak. I was, mm -hmm. life was kicking me in the butt. I could never figure out why I was always angry, why I was always upset, uh, why I never really progressed in my career, even though I felt like I had talents. Mm -hmm. um, I could write very well early on. I was a, I was the nerd in college that did a double major in poli sci and English. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I made straight A's in, in, in English classes. And I just, I loved it, but there was always something missing. And of course, all through that coping with it was going to the crappiest of crappy garbage that I could find. And, and it was not any consciousness to what I was putting in my mouth. Right. I was eating I was eating my feelings away. And of course, people say that phrase a lot. But in this case, it was literally the only thing that made me feel good. Because in the midst of what my dad was doing, he owned restaurants at the time. And, and he had this place called the Buffet House. And so in a little bottle of routine, see, and uh, I would eat and eat and eat and eat. And that habit became an adult habit which packed on the pounds. That's when I got to weigh 410 pounds. It was all through my 20s, really ballooning up until 32 when I started the Atkins diet, the story I told earlier. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think some people go to drugs, some people go to alcohol, some people go to different relationships and having sex. I chose the crappiest of foods mm -hmm. and, and those were the consequences. And of course, now there's metabolic consequences all these years later that, I didn't really come to terms with my childhood trauma till like the last year. Mm -hmm. And even now I'm still working with mm -hmm. a life coach who is a licensed therapist who kind of helps me through some of the head stuff. I'm in a far better place now mm -hmm. than I was even like a year ago. Um, but people don't really mind this aspect of their health journey. Oh my God, I got to get my diet right. And usually when people say I'm struggling, my diet's perfect. I'm, done, I'm like, okay, it's not your diet it's unresolved. You got some trauma in your back. Oh yeah. I was sexually abused when I was 12. I'm like, well, there it is. Have you ever done anything about, it? Oh, it was just so long ago. I said, don't fool yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. It was long ago in time, but it's right here, right now, right here. I still have flashes in my head to this day, Tara, mm -hmm. of my head to walls. And I remember one time he threw me so hard into the wall in the house that it left a big crater that the next day he had to spackle it. It was, I mean, it basically busted through the sheetrock. Wow. That hard head, but it hurt like hell. And, and I was bleeding out the side of the head and it's just, yeah. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a lot of trauma. And I think first, thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm, I'm very open a lot about, about the trauma that I've had in my life. And I had childhood sex abuse as well. And, um, all, and, and, and I did the same thing. I, here I am married and like, oh, it just didn't happen. Like, it's no worries. Like I forgive them like the end. <laughs> and there's like no processing of all of the habits and, um, like basically acting out of our, you know, as Eckhart Tolle talks about our pain body, like I'm acting out of that and I have no awareness of it until I'm actually willing to look at it. And I appreciate you sharing this because, uh, I love this quote from Brene Brown. She says that you need three things in a Petri dish for shame to grow exponentially. And that's secrecy, silence, and judgment. And nobody wants to talk. You're not supposed to talk about that. You're not supposed to talk about being sexually abused or physically abused or any of that. And as we keep that a secret, we keep it inside of us, that shame grows exponentially. And if you look at the research of David R. Hawkins, he's amazing. Um, he, they, they study um, energy when you are in certain emotions, how strong you are. And shame and guilt are the very lowest, right? So here we are, we're in this, we're keeping secret. We're not talking about it. Or we're literally living out of the lowest vibration possible possible. 
How are we ever supposed to make the most out of our lives? And it all starts with getting rid of secrecy and silence. And the judgment comes, we think people are going to judge us. That's not what's going to happen. Somebody's hearing this and they're like, that happened to me too. Okay, what'd you do, right? If they're not judging us, they're like listening, you know? And so thank you for sharing that, first of all, because it's so healing as we're all, like some of us are brave enough to say, guess what, this happened to me. And everybody else is like, oh my gosh, me too. Okay, what do we do about it? And now healing can happen. I want to add an addendum because- Last year, I've really been digging deep why this happened. Uh, You could think that way about your sexual abuser, but why did they do that? Maybe they were sexually abused or some way. For my dad, he was, he had his dad, who I never knew, my grandpa uh, died before I was born. And so he was an alcoholic. And when he was alcoholic, he would beat the crap out of my dad, uh, his brother and my grandmother. Yep. Um, and, and would scold them and yeah, so that's what he learned. Yeah. So when he's in his early twenties, he had my brother, Kevin at 17, he was 21 when he had me just barely out of the house. No wonder he knows how to parent yep. you scream at the kid and you beat them. That's right. what he learned. So why would we expect them to just automatically know what to do? And so knowing that part of his own personal history and his own trauma gave me a heart of gratefulness that, okay, now I have a little bit of an understanding. It still doesn't take away the pain that happened, but I have better understanding. Now, there is one more caveat I want to throw in this story. When I came back from sabbatical and I got real honest about some of this childhood trauma stuff, I was putting it out there Mm -hmm. on Jimmy Rand my other content and he caught wind of it Mm. and he called my mom, him and my mom don't talk at all. It had been 12 years. My brother, Kevin died of heart disease at 41 back in 2008. So since 2008, he had not called, he called her and he's like, I think there's something wrong with our son. He's spreading lies online. And my mom already knew the whole story. I'd already talked to her about what happened. Mm. She had no idea. I was beat when I was kids. Mm. She she only found that out last year. And he was denying it. Oh, it never happened. I don't know why he's saying all that. And, da, da, da. and my mom said, you know what? Go to hell. And she hung up on him. And she told me what happened. And I, I basically, for my own emotional state, uh, cut him out of my life. Yeah. Because if he ever dealt with his own trauma, Tara, I, I really can't have the real conversation with him. And if I can't have a real conversation and and connect with him on that higher level, as you're talking about, there's no sense in me investing any more emotional energy into that right. relationship. Yep. Is that hard to cut off your dad like that? Yeah, sure mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it the right thing to do? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and it'll be sad when he dies and it'll be sad when all of that happens, but he messed up he had the opportunity to confront his trauma just like I'm doing now. And he's choosing to look the other way. Oh, it's way long time ago. Oh, and, but then the selectiveness in not wanting to at least admit, like if he, here's, here's what would resolve the relationship between me and him. Look, I know I did some bad things and I am so, so sorry. My dad beat me when I was a kid and I really never learned to deal with that hurt that I had. And I took it out on you and I really never should. You've turned into a successful man in your life, despite me, not because of me. And I'm so proud of you. And I love you. Never heard any of that. So I had to let him go. And I'm glad. Because there's people in my life. I'm closer to my mom now than I've ever been before. And there is, everybody has their own family stuff. But when you start connecting deeper with people, and I'm connecting with my mom, she's 70 something now. And I connect deeper with her now than I have my entire life. Mm. And those are the kind of relationships that I 
the one in my life that go there and are unafraid to touch any subject. You asked earlier why I'm so bold to talk about controversial subjects. That's where I go. I'm vulnerable. I'm trying to be as honest a human being as possible. Mm -hmm. And it was going through that tough stuff with my dad that honestly, even thinking of it right now, if I hadn't have gone through that and all the everything, the pain that came with it, I wouldn't be the Jimmy you know today. Mm-hmm. I'm totally that guy because of those things. It's not saying go beach kids and make them be great humans later. Doesn't mm-hmm. always work out that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think individual resolve can turn beauty from ashes and, oh, yeah. and make you great. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for sh- sharing that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being so vulnerable and open. I, that's immediately when you were talking about that story, that was like literally the exact same thing I was going to say next, because, um, my relationship with my parents, and and this is what I, I use this in my coaching too, when often we are in victim stories with lots of things with our parents. This is a a more extreme, like, okay, yeah, but like there's little micro traumas that people have that are like relative, right? So it's like my mom would always say like, oh, honey, you'd look so much better if you just lost five pounds. That's like traumatic for a lot of people. Like it totally changed. And so what I usually say was like, well, what was your mom's relationship like with her mom? Oh, her mom was like psycho about the way they looked and blah, blah, blah. So then you start to come into this place of compassion. So thank you for sharing that for me it was um, with both of my parents. I was judging them very harshly. And we do this, right? We expect so much of our parents because as little kids, they are supposed to be in our heads. They're supposed to be like, they know everything. They're like the perfect human that I'm going to follow and learn from. And so we judge them really harshly as adults. And it was an ayahuasca actually for me that I was shown my parents through the eyes of God. I don't know how else to say it. Like I looked at them. I watched their whole lives through what felt like the eyes of God. And I was filled with so much compassion for them because I saw their brokenness. I saw their traumas. I saw their pains that they had been through. I saw how, I felt how bad they wanted to do better. They wanted to overcome it. They they were trying and I literally grieved for them. Like I was filled with so much love and it changed my relationship with them forever. So I think, oh, and I, and there, so there is definitely a place of compassion. And when you come out of this low vibration of victim, you, and you come into a higher vibration of compassion, it changes you, right? It's so important. It's true forgiveness. It's like, no, I really, truly actually see what happened there. And I, my heart hurts for you. Thank you. And it's not about them. It's about you. Right, right. Like you can't control them. You can't. They don't deserve my forgiveness. And I'm like, forgiveness isn't about them. It's about you. 100%. They because can- most of the time, like his whole life, my dad's whole life, he has thought nothing about smashing my head into walls and demasculating me and telling me I'm a faggot and telling me I'll never attract a girl and da, 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 all the stuff he said. Oh, and by the way, in the midst of all this trauma, I'm an honor roll student. And he kept threatening to send me to reform school and just like all this like ugly stuff how i make good grades i have no idea other than i'm just a nerd (laughs) like can you imagine if i was nurtured how good a grade i would have been top of my class yeah yeah it's interesting though i mean i i think everything happens for a reason i really do fully believe that um for me too i mean there's so much craziness in my time i was just like you i was the honor society president but you know back home my mom's like wow i don't know how you're doing this like wow good job like you know there was no support but i think in a lot of ways that really helped me evolve in my own strength so i'm grateful for that you know um but i think you also hit on something that is really important really really important and that is not having shame or guilt about codependent behaviors that are almost expected in our culture. It's like, Jimmy, if you're a good person, you if you forgive him, that means you just like let him in your life and just keep let, like having no boundaries. And it's almost expected. And you're what you're hitting there is so key. I think we all need to hit on this. And so much of this, by the way, is is fat, is fat loss, is health, is because this is the stuff that holds us up. Um, and it's that 
the, when you filled your cup with love, when you, as you've been doing this work, and I love that you're showing that you're, you're still on this journey as we all are, none of us are dead yet. So we're all on this journey of healing and growth. You know, it's not like, oh, I did my healing and growth and now I'm evolved and done. Like <laughs> whoop, now you're in danger zone. So I love how you say that, but it's also so important for us to, to love ourselves enough to show up for us the way your mom showed up for you on that phone call. She showed up for you. She's like, no. <laughs> and you're also, when you have that love for yourself, just like I always talk about this, I'm being your own mom, right? That's how we should treat ourselves is like being your own mom. Like saying like, mm, I, you know, honey, like I don't think it's a good idea for you to be around him because that he's not showing you love or respect or whatever. And being okay with that, not shaming ourselves for that because getting into those, those codependent behaviors of, you know, it's almost like our ego gets wrapped into it. We have to be like, if I'm really a good person, then I'm going to like violate all these boundaries and, and now be in this like toxic environment all the time. And that makes me a good person, but it's like causing all this misery and pain. That's not self-love. And sometimes we have to make those hard decisions in the name of self-love and in, you know, your dad can listen to any of these podcasts and hear you say what you just said, which brought you as a grown man to tears saying, this is what I need from you. And he, that's his choice. You can't control it. You it's out there. He can choose it if he wants and that's it. But self-love a lot of times is creating that safe space for us. So we don't have to continue to be in emotional turmoil unnecessarily. So years, Tara, he re-abused me over and over and over in my mind. And I think that emotional abuse stuck around another 15 years after I finally came to terms, which ironically was about the time I started my weight loss journey originally with Atkins was right mm -hmm. at that 15 year mark. I left the yes. house at, and it was 32 when I started the Atkins diet. So that right, right about that time. And it's been 15 years since then mm -hmm. where I am now. And mm -hmm. so it's a process. I think we want to hurry up and be healed and you can't hurry healing when the cuts are deep. You kind of have to let nature take its course. Um, mm -hmm. And I know I'm a far better man today and human being today, having done some of this like work of mm -hmm. waiting on that healing. Like it's kind of like the football player that tries to come back too soon from an ACL injury. You're going to re-injure it. And if you try to get back out there, emotionally speaking with that, unhealed ego, emotional state, whatever you want to call it, you're going to re-injure it and you're going to be set back that much further. So put in the time, put in the healing, because once you're healed, then you can be a benefit to the world and to the people around you and your sphere of influence. That's what has me excited coming on this next chapter of my life is the world is my oyster, as they say. Mm -hmm. And I have so much hope because I'm in a better place here with my trauma. Mm -hmm. I'm in a better place in my life. Still would like to lose some weight, but I'm healthy and I feel good. And I have good relationships in my life that go deep. Mm -hmm. Like I, I am a blessed man. I love it so much. Thank you for sharing that. I relate to that so much. And it is, it's the not denying the pain anymore be an opening. Like it's literally like open your mouth and say it. If anybody's listening, if you have trauma or you have secrets or you've got something that you've got a bunch of shame about and every, every time it pops up, you're like, I'm not saying anything about that. That thing, if you will release it, you can heal it. That is the opening the gate because you right now, like just talking about this, you're welcoming and healing. It's, it, it's, it's going to come in an abundance because you are saying, hi, like, here's the deal. I need some healing for this. The universe hears that God hears that people hear that. Like all all of these things will start coming in. So if you're listening to this, it's touching a chord with you. You got to open up. You know, I had um, Amber Sears. I don't know if you know her. JP Sears' wife was the yeah. first episode on my podcast, and she talked about how she had. He's adorable on those videos with JP. They did one recently <laughs> about relating how to fix your man, and she's like reading from a little manual. I'm like those are perfect for each other. They are. They're amazing. And she is such a beautiful soul. Like I met her at Paleo Effects and I was just like, I love you. Um, and she came on and she talked about um, bulimia, having bulimia for a really long time. And she didn't tell anybody. And it wasn't, J it was the guy she was dating before JP. She like, wasn't even, she's hiding it from him. And finally one day she just spoke it. 
And that's when all the healing came after that. She finally just told, just tell somebody you trust and know you can trust and love and start that healing. That's to me, that's how it was like, let it out, you know, and then you invite the healing. So thank you for setting the example on that. You're doing that over and over and over in your life. You did it with keto. You've done it with leading out on the, all the issues that you talk about on Jimmy Rants and all your speaking, everything you're doing. You're saying, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to be brave and I'm going to stand up and I'm freaking talk about it. And let's see what happens. And look how much magic has happened. And so look at the ripple effect of that. Right. Yeah. So incredible. So thank you for doing that. And people write me DMS all the time, just especially after the childhood trauma stuff, Tara, they're like, finally, somebody normalizing this for me because right. people hold that shame like i had shame for years i was like i must have done something that caused this trauma and it wasn't until i kind of came to terms with no i had nothing to do with it i was the victim of it but i had nothing to do with perpetrating that trauma because the uh, usually the perpetrators would be well you deserved this and so you kind of like set that in your mindset. Well, I must have done something to deserve it. And of course he was highly a narcissist, highly a gaslighter, like all those things mm -hmm. that I know you talk about in his pet peeves of yours as well, mm -hmm. of letting, not letting people like that control your life. And so I'm trying to weed those kinds of people out of my life. And if you're not feeding into me, you're sucking out of me. Like we were saying earlier, I want a lot of feeders and I want to be a feeder. I want, and I do, I'm such a natural encourager. It's almost like I've been through so much stuff in my life. It gives me a heart and a love for people that may be, but for going through those things, I wouldn't have. Yeah. And there's, there's one other thing I want to hit on before we leave. Um, oh, we're leaving. Wow. We've no, well, before we, before we end, before I have to hit this. So one thing I've really been tuned into lately is that we will go great lengths for love. Great lengths for love. And when you were telling that story about how your dad had the all-you-can-eat buffet, I thought about that. And I thought that was a moment in which you were, so, in, probably in your perception, perceiving some love from your dad. Like, this is a good hookup that I have from my dad. Like, I get to eat whatever I want here. Like, this is a good situation for me and my family. Like, it was kind of like food was shown through endless or love was shown through endless food, right? And so in order for you, when you're not feeling love, when you're feeling isolated, you're feeling sad, not only are you, of course, getting the dopamine hit from food that we all like, but you were getting an extra bonus of this is like how I receive love, right? And that's pattern in. And I've seen this in like all sorts of, this happens a lot with men with dads. I've seen, it's like really, really strong with men with dads. Like if your dad was like, Hey, like you perceive you get love for being good at a sport or you perceive that you get love for getting good grades or being successful or making money that will drive a man to the freaking moon to get that perceived love. And so I love that you shared that because it makes me think like, what are, what are we doing in our lives? What kind of like addictions do we have? You know, for me a little while it was working out and getting super fit was like, oh, I was getting all this attention and love. I, I perceived it as love. It drove my behaviors crazy hard because I was perceiving that I have to do this in order to get love. This is a way, this feels like love to me. So like, it's cool for us to look at those associations that we've built somewhere on our path that's not serving us at all because we first, it feels like love to us because of something that happened in our past. And now that you say that thing, it's so funny. Like when you vibe with someone like you and I do as friends, you brought to mind Wednesdays were my favorite day to come home from school. I would come home from school on Wednesdays. And what would be the first thing I do? I go right to the restaurant because we had our house next to the restaurant and I would go right to the buffet because what was on Wednesday's meal macaroni and cheese and I literally would take that big ass tray and I would just put as much of it on there as I possibly could because that was what I associated with happiness mm -hmm. with love with like you were saying um and of course I enjoyed it it tasted good the dopamine hit all the things right. and I that probably was the start of this major carb addiction that I had that I then had to overcome many years later it's gross now. I've actually tried a few times since I went keto and low carb uh, mac and cheese. I'm like, why did I ever think this tasted good? It was just, yeah. just disgusting. Uh, I sometimes do like the macaphony and cheese. Have you ever yeah. done that? So good. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, it's so funny. Like you, like I literally could not wait to get home from school on mm-hmm. Wednesday because mac and cheese was on the menu. And then I'd get there sometimes and there would be none left. I, I, I don't want fried okra. I don't want black eyed peas. I want, I, I want mac and cheese. Like it was just this mm-hmm. so weird. And like your comment brought that to mind. Oh yeah. I used to really get excited because I guess when you're abused and going through trauma, you take it was you look happiness. For any happiness. And that was, right. and it's sad. Like my happiness was Mac cheese Wednesdays. Yeah. Your happiness was food. That was like the good part of your life. Right. Of like, yay, I have this, like, well, this stuff sucks, but I got this one good part. Right. So it like equates this thing in your brain of like, this brings me happiness. This is like the good part of my life. Right. And it gets an astronomical, huge focus because of all the other things that were happening in the background. Right. And then we grew up and because it's painful, like our brains try to protect us from pain. Like even right now, like Um, if I try to remember my sexual abuse, my brain is just kind of like, it's like, I know it happened, but I don't, it's like, I almost can't make my brain like think about it. Like the actual acts of it happening. It just is like, it protects me. It's just like, nope. And that's why doing things like plant medicine journeys have been helpful because I actually relived one of the experiences in a journey, but it was super incredibly healing for me because I saw it from a place of compassion. I saw it from like a more adult perspective. I had that compassion on my perpetrator, if you want to call it that. And I cried all the tears that I never cried afterwards. Right. It just, it was like this huge purge and I think um, our, our our brains want to protect us from the pain and just focus on whatever was good during that time. And so sometimes it gets like an astronomical focus. And so a food was like this one escape for you while you're going through a traumatic period of your life. Like now, next time you have any kind of stress or whatever, you're like, that brings happiness. I'm doing that, right? So I think it leads to so many food addictions because of these things. But if you can deal with the traumas, right, you can learn how to release and not need to feel better from food, right? Because now you don't, you're not in trauma. You're not in stress. You don't have anything to feel better from. And and that's where low carb keto has been phenomenal because that kind of takes away a lot of the physiological responses. Right. You still have responses that could drive you to eating things that you shouldn't. But once you kind of calm those things down in your body, mm-hmm it's a lot easier, which is why I'm a huge, especially people, if you've been through trauma, you need to be on a low carb ketogenic diet kind of as a baseline. And then kind of as you're working through your trauma, adjust it from there. If you need to add in a few more carbs or whatever, but like, I think it's almost this, it's going to mitigate some of the negative effects while you're still working on your healing. I love that perspective because it's, you have physiological and emotional um, uh, like issues going against you, right? Like you've got physiological dependence on carbohydrates. Your body's like, please, you're going to die if you don't have more carbs. You're trying to fight that. And you have all these emotional issues with food that you haven't dealt with, like good luck, right? So I love that because it's kind of like when, once you can heal those physiological temptations, you know, or at least pull them down a lot by going low carb keto. Now you only have one thing you're dealing, you you don't have double whammy coming against you. I love that perspective. That's really insightful. Well, and then as you're holding on to some of those emotional things, like people say, well, I have this grotesque belly on me and I want to get rid of the belly. I'm like, okay, that grotesque belly is protecting you from stuff. Mm -hmm. Like we, we often forget the reason you have body fat is not to make you look ugly or to make you look porkly or whatever you, you you know, descriptive term you want to use. It's, there's a protective mechanism. That body fat is binding up all kinds of toxins that would harm you. It's doing all kinds of things. And I think some of the trauma is bound up in there as well. Mm -hmm. And as you start to release the trauma, it kind of starts to release that body fat. I'm still working on that part of my journey, Tara, and I'm excited about that. Yeah. When I start finding happiness uh, in relationships again and doing all the things that, that that's going to do, I'm finding happiness in a lot of friendship relationships. I have gone deep with uh, a good half dozen people uh, in my life this year that, that I've really not done that before. And so it's kind of exciting. Like, 
I'm seeking out those people that want to go there. And if they're willing to go there, I'm willing to go there and be totally open and honest and have them be totally open and honest. Like what kind of world are we going to live in? If, if everybody's like really authentic and real and man, if we could take that to social media, we could change this world. Totally. And it's amazing how good your health gets when you're happy. <laughs> it's a key part of health, right? And so, yeah, sometimes we have to go through some rough changes to get that to ourselves. But I'm, I am excited to see what happens for you in your journey now that, yeah, you're going through some hard times right now. You're going through a lot of healing. You're going through a lot of shifts. But I am excited to see what happens for you when you're on the other side of this and you're further along in your healing and processing journey. Like for me, that has been the ticket to all of it, right? Of, of maintaining health, of like choosing it, wanting it, feeling worthy of it every day. It's just like, it's a no brainer, you know, and I'm unapologetic about that. You know, I'm not like, Hey kids, does it make you feel bad if I go to the, de-? no, <laughs> I'll be back. Um, you guys have the kitchen clean when I get back. <laughs> right. So it's amazing when we continuously choose ourselves, how much goodness comes into our life, how much health, how much abundance, how much, how deeper the relationships get. It's amazing. And you attract the things and the people yep. that you always wanted like this is and i know you you want to leave the show but this is such an important point i am already seeing it manifest that i'm attracting people and things that i've always desired in my heart and for the longest time letting those suppression of those feelings with the trauma and not really dealing with them adequately and i never really felt like i was getting anywhere remember in my 20s i saw my i never felt like i was appreciated for what I could bring and da da da. And then I lose the weight and start my own business. And I've been doing that ever since. And it's even been taken to another level now in, in specific personal relationships, friendships, um, hopefully yeah. in the future relationships. Um, and then even in the like activities and things in my life, I'm shifting, not just talking about keto stuff and not being in a box that way, but talking about childhood trauma and just talking about what's important to me and what's in my heart. And I think those things are important and it's all a part of finding yourself and becoming what you've always meant to be. Yeah, I love it. Thank you so much. I resonate with you so deeply. I think that's why just through our professional interactions, we're like, you get it, you get it. I, I'm, I'm with you on that. Um, so, so the biggest things for people to find, I mean, guys, make sure that you're following Jimmy on social media. You're so good about, I mean, he's so much amazing content. It's not just like Jimmy Rance is like, it's not, I love your perspectives, but you also share a lot of like really cool up and coming information on health or like what's actually, you know, the latest. So it's like, oh, thank you for being a resource for all of us. So make sure that you're following him. It's just, is it living La Vida low carb or what? It, what's your, no, living, what is your Instagram handle? Living low carb, man? You- Living low carb man. Living low carb man, right? No G on living. Got it. Okay. And then, yeah. On, so how else would you like people to partake of what you've got going on right now? Yeah. Find me LLVLC stands for living la vida low carb.com. Uh, and then of course this show that I do here at Jimmy Rant studio is Jimmy Rants.com. We go live every single day during the week, Monday through Friday, 11 a.m. Eastern time. And uh, yeah, I go all over the board on that show. This week I happen that we're recording, I happen to do four studies this week. And then I do Fridays, like kind of an open, ask me anything. Uh, But yeah, I go all over the place. If it's something that's interesting to me, then I'm talking about it. Yeah, I love it. And that's, see, that's your nerdy side coming out and serving you. It's awesome because you're like actually talking about real issues and getting into the latest research. It's such a good resource for all of us. So thank you for doing that. So um, I guess we'll go ahead and close this up. Jimmy, thank you so much for being real, for being you, for pushing forward, for healing, for sharing your journey along the way. Like most people are not willing to be that vulnerable, you know? So thank you for doing that. I, I really, really value you. You're such a such a wonderful, beautiful addition to our industry. You're, you're pushing forward, you're leading, you're sharing vulnerably. I mean, it's all the things. And that's what, that's what we need is we just, we need leadership, but we also need realness, you know, and connection. So thank you for bringing that here on this show today, but just in general. And Tara, you know how much I adore you and the work you're doing. Keep up the great work. And as always, anything I can do for you, you know, I'm here as a friend. Likewise. Thank you.